The driver of my video today could be called the champ of champ car. Not a champion of champ car, but the champion of the champ car world series. If you're not very familiar with the confusing landscape of open wheeled racing in the Americas in the late 90s and early 2000s, then short story. The now IndyCar series was split into two series. One was the Indy Racing League, which mostly focused on US ovals. The other was CART, which raced more internationally with only a few ovals. Due to sponsorship and finances, in 2004, the CART series was rebranded as the Champ Car World Series until 2008, where it merged into the IndyCar series as the world knows today. So in the four years of his existence, the Champ Car World Series only had one champion because in 2004, 5, 6, and 7, the champion was none other than Sebastian Bourdais. So the phrase son of Le Mans is not just a colorful metaphor. Sebastian Olivier Bourdais was born in the French endurance racing capital of the world, Le Mans, France, on the 28th of February, 1979. The fact he was born here wasn't purely coincidental. He was born to the racing world, into a racing family. Sebastian's father is Patrick Bourdais, and his mother is pictured here. See, unfortunately, and sort of surprisingly, in my research I found roughly three photos with his mother over the years, and I could never find a name or much about who she is. I read articles in English and French, watched old Champ Car and Indy Car broadcasts, and the most I could ever get was, according to the announcer, she missed the final race where Sebastian won his first Champ Car championship because she had to work and was unable to attend. Now I suppose my pipe dream for this channel is to reach a degree of journalistic notoriety where I could interview the drivers directly and get the story of their life in their own words, but currently I obviously have to rely on the research of secondary and tertiary sources. That being said, if that's an idea that you think is quality, then comment and subscribe because it could help this channel grow and maybe someday reach that potential. But until then, we make do with what we know. And what we do know is that his father Patrick came from the Brittany region of France. He did not come from a wealthy background but had a dream to pursue racing. In order to better improve his chances for success in racing, he would go to the mecca of racing in his country of France. He was an accomplished racer participating in a variety of cars at club and national levels and being in Le Mans helped him gain more notoriety. He won the 1991 French Renault Clio Cup and would come in second in the Renault Clio International Cup in 94-95. He has made a total of 8 starts in the 24 hours of Le Mans in his career and was inevitably the one that got Sebastian into karting and was his first racing sponsor. Of course, with putting more effort into supporting his son, it became harder to support his own racing career and his racing would become less frequent in the mid 90s. When his son became more successful and independent, Patrick would again pick up the hobby of racing for a couple years in the mid 2000s. However, Patrick did not force his son to race. In the beginning, it was just a desire that came from Sebastian. And Patrick also made sure it wasn't just a fad of wanting to be like father that would pass when young Sebastian had grown tired of it. The Bourdais family lived in the French countryside outside of Le Mans, and it was here where Bourdais' love of driving, or in this case riding, would begin. Young Sebastian's joy for things with wheels would start at age three. In the summer, while his family was on holiday at a ski resort, they had traveled into a little nearby town and somewhat strangely, his father purchased a Yamaha PW50. Halfway up the drive back to the top of the mountain, his father stopped and popped Sebastian on the bike and had him drive the rest of the way up. Meanwhile, his mother was freaking out because it was the first time Sebastian had ever ridden something like that. Seabass says after that he wanted to be on his bike, or an ATC, or an ATV, any chance he got. They lived in the countryside and had a considerable number of fields for him to make tracks across. Seb describes himself as a lonely soul. He spent all day out there riding in the fields and woods until he would run out of gas. Past this, he grew up surrounded by racing. His father was still making a successful hobby out of it, and he would often see his father race. He had even gotten a couple opportunities to drive a cart at a young age and by around 7 or 8 started pressuring his father to get him one as well. However, his father was not very quick to indulge his son. He wanted to be sure his son was at least persistent in his desire. It took about two years of pressuring, but on Seb's 10th birthday in 1989, the family was at the circuit Alain Prost kart track at Le Mans and would gift their son his first kart. His father Patrick says he could sense almost immediately his son was gifted as Sebastian would begin setting rapid lap times, had a good fluid line, and was already pretty comfortable in his machine. By age 11, the pair was packing his go-kart in the back of his mother's Peugeot 205 and went around karting. 
While both really didn't have the mechanical expertise on the cart, they knew enough to display Seb's talent. He would go around winning races and collecting regional trophies, and in 1991 and 93 would win the Maine Britannia Karting League. In the same year of 93, he would also finish fourth in the France Cadet Kart Championship. In the same year, at age 14, he spent a lot of time on his scooter. His home was roughly 28 kilometers away from his school, so nearly every morning he would have to ride to class. When he was 16, he upgraded to a 125cc motorcycle. He also upgraded and made his first steps into single-seater racing. His first single-seater race would come during the 1995 Formula Renault campus. During this year, his father recalls at a race in Dijon where the track was both wet and dry. Sebastian had never driven in these type of conditions before, but he would come from 16th and 12th on the grid to win both races. He says it was at this moment he remembers thinking his son could make a career in racing. During this time, he continued to race karts as well, and in the following year he would dominate at the Le Mans 24 karting event. By this point, racing in Formula 1 was no longer a dream for Bourdais, because he said in a past interview that a dream is when something is unobtainable, now it was simply a career option. And his performance in single-seaters in 1995 got him promoted to the Formula Renault French Championship with Elf Oil team Lafayette. In 1996, he would finish 7th and get a podium, but in 1997, he would finish the championship in 2nd, 1 point behind the winner, and would get 3 wins and 10 podiums on the season. Besides his successes in the junior open-wheeled categories, Bourdais was also very studious. He would finish his baccalaureate degree in math and physics and would then continue his scientific studies at his university around the age of 20. By this time, he says he was struggling to stay in touch with his studies and be on time for classes while also attending races. Fortunately, his Renault Clio diesel was fast enough to get him from place to place, maybe a little too fast. Seba said he didn't really know how to drive on the road, he only knew how to drive on the track, and it nearly got him to trouble a couple times. In 1998, he was promoted to French Formula 3 again with the Elf team. He would get two podiums this year and finish sixth in the championship, winning the best rookie honors. The next year, he would repeat his campaign, but would be much more successful. Three poles, 11 podiums, and eight victories on his way to winning the championship. In 1999, he would also take part in his first 24 hours of Le Mans with Labre competition. Bourdais was doing well on his journey through his junior career, however, he wasn't really on the radar of any F1 teams. This annoyed former French F1 driver Henri Pescarolo, who believed the current French F1 teams were squandering all the talent rising in France. To try and help him get noticed, Henri had Sebastian team up with fellow Frenchman Emmanuel Clerico and Olivier Gouillard for Pescarolo Sport in the 2000 Le Mans, finishing fourth behind all the Audis. He would also enter Formula 3000 International and get a podium, finishing ninth in the standings in his rookie year. Next year would see Le Mans with Pescarolo, some dabbling in the French and FIA GT series, a little American Le Mans, and fourth in the Formula 3000 Championship with a win and three podiums for the French Dams team. 2002 would see Le Mans with Pescarolo, fourth in the FIA Sports Car Championship with Pescarolo, and a championship in Formula 3000 for Supernova Racing with three wins and eight podiums. His good performances, and agent Nicholas Tott, had gotten Bourdais the opportunity to be a test driver for both Arrows and Renault that year. However, neither would result in an F1 drive, as Arrows would go bankrupt before 2003, and Renault wasn't looking to replace drivers Jarno Trulli or Jensen Button until they did. Instead of F1, in 2003, Seb had worked out a deal to race in the American Open Wheeled Series known as Kart Champ Car. This was the last year where the series would be under the Kart Championship Auto Racing Team sanctioning body. Since the series had just lost engine providers Honda and Toyota, there were many vacancies on the grid. As such, Sebastian was joining the previous championship winning team, Newman Haas Racing, ran by Paul Newman and Carl Haas. He would win Rookie of the Year, getting three wins, seven podiums, and five poles, finishing fourth in the standings. The year 2004 would see the ending of CART as a sanctioning body, and would see the series simply known as the Champ Car World Series. It would also see the start of the Bourdais dominance. He wins 7 out of 14 races, gets 10 podiums and 8 poles, winning the championship. 2005, 6 wins in 13 races, 7 podiums and 5 poles, wins the championship. In 2006, he returns again, and wins again with 7 victories, 12 podiums, and 6 poles in 14 races. 
Over the last three years, he has also branched out a little and done some American Le Mans series in both prototypes and GTs, the International Race of Champions, and in this year renewed his role as Formula One test driver, this time for Scuderia Toro Rosso. 2007 sees another repeat, when the Champ Car Championship with 8 victories, 9 podiums, and 6 poles, test drive for Toro Rosso, and return to Le Mans, this time with Team Peugeot finishing second again. The last four years in America has seen Bourdais breaking and setting records in open wheel racing, but it has also gotten him back into the Formula One conversation, and in 2008 he would finally fulfill the childhood dream of racing in Formula One. Bourdais' F1 debut happened in the first race to not use traction control since 2001 at the Australian Grand Prix. He would qualify 17th, but in the race would make his way up to running 4th. However, with 3 laps remaining, the Toro Rosso would suffer an engine issue and he would retire the car. He would still end up being classified as finishing 7th and getting points on debut. The rest of the year was mixed. Some decent performances hampered by car reliability, questionable penalty calls, or incorrect tire choice during rain. Arguably, one of the hardest races to swallow was the 2008 Italian Grand Prix. While teammate Sebastian Vettel took pole, Bourdais qualified fourth. Vettel would win the race in the classic epic tale, and Bourdais would finish a lap behind in 18th. But that doesn't really tell the whole story. See, Bourdais' car wouldn't select first gear on the grid, and he would have to start from the pit lane. And after the safety car start of the race, he would be a lap down. While he would remain a lap down, he would set the second fastest lap of the race only second to Kimi Raikkonen. Had Bourdais not had the gear select problem, maybe he could have been on for a podium, or more. Who knows? He would end the year only scoring twice for a total of 4 points. Going into 2009, Bourdais was unsure if he would have another year in the car, but eventually while Vettel was promoted to Red Bull, Bourdais was retained by Toro Rosso to be paired with rookie Sebastian Buemi. The year started well with the team scoring double points in the first round in Australia, and Bourdais would score another point later that year in Monaco. But after round 9, he was dropped from the team. Infamously, the story says that Red Bull fired Bourdais via text message, Franz Toss citing that their partnership had not produced the results they had wanted. Seb was advised he had grounds for legal action with a breach of his contract, and he was able to settle the matter with Toro Rosso out of court for an amount of 2.1 million US dollars. When speaking about the matter now, Sebastian says he is glad he went to Formula 1 to satisfy a dream, but if he knew then what he knows now, he would tell his past self to avoid it. He had the incorrect misconception of what to expect at Toro Rosso. He went there believing the team wanted to work with him as the more experienced driver to use his technical knowledge to build a car that would move its way up the grid. In reality, they just wanted to pop in drivers to test them for a potential promotion to the premier Red Bull team. When it came to the car itself, it wasn't bad, but the setup didn't fit his driving style, and when you have rookies with great potential matching the car pretty well, the suggestions of the second driver to derail that success fell on deaf ears. That being said, the way the situation ended was very unprofessional. Bourdais would finish 2009 with a second place at Le Mans with Peugeot for Traditions and he would do the last eight races of the Super League Formula, which was a formula racing series where teams were supposed to be sponsored by football clubs. Bourdais only did eight of a possible 14 races, but still tied for the most wins in the series at two, and second most podiums at six. This is a very weird series, but maybe Driver61 could explain it because Scott Mansell raced for two rounds at Donington. In 2010, he would run another partial season of this odd series, and he just bounced around. American Le Mans, V8 Supercar Invitationals, second at Le Mans for Peugeot in 2011, but wins at various other tracks across the international Le Mans circuit for Team Peugeot. Also, in 2011, Bourdais would return to open wheeled racing in the USA driving the IZOD IndyCar series for Dale Coyne Racing. He would spend the next decade here gaining the reputation of Giant Slayer, always driving for small, barely funded teams, Dale Coyne Racing, Dragon Racing, KV Racing, AJ Ford Enterprises. He would often manage performances that were beyond the car he drove, occasional podiums, and even occasional victories. The idea of Bourdais getting a drive with a powerhouse team was something that came up multiple times, but the contracts always fell the wrong way. He was always locked in when someone bigger came asking. He would win the Daytona 24 overall in 2014, and a class victory in 2017. 
He would finally get a Le Mans victory in 2016 with a class win partnered with Chip Ganassi Ford. Thanks to issues with sponsor money and team outlook, in 2022, Bourdais jumped from his struggling IndyCar team and took a quality ride with Chip Ganassi in the IMSA Endurance Series that gives him a real opportunity to compete every week. It is an issue every driver faces, trying to get a funded ride with a quality team, but the fact that Bourdais never returned to the peak of American open wheeled racing still baffles me. If he had gotten an opportunity, would he have been as dominant as the first go round? Would the record books be further rewritten with the name Bourdais scribbled all over them? And why can't I buy old Bourdais merchandise on his website? Unfortunately, these questions will never be answered. What a comeback! That is a very fitting victory! Thank you to everyone who watched this video, and I'm hoping to start putting out maybe a couple of other different videos to help fill the voids in between each one of these driver profile research videos. But until then, my next driver, someone who has dark hair, is kind of lanky and grew up in a country where motorsports were illegal. So if you're interested in that, be sure to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time on Driver Profiles.